Uh, my name is Matt Dunn, and I am your town moderator. Uh, and we have a uh, packed agenda for this evening. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming uh, tonight. Um, we are working through a couple of uh, fun Zoom uh, technical difficulties, but we are in good hands uh, with CATV uh, to be able to navigate it and to make sure that we um, do the uh, work uh, that is intended before us. Uh, just as a reminder, this is an, uh, an informational meeting. Uh, this is not the town meeting that you may be used to. Uh, there will not be uh, voting on the individual articles uh, tonight. Uh, there will be an opportunity to be able to talk, uh, to hear uh, about the articles, to get some additional information, uh, and to ask questions. Uh, I'm Because it's an informational meeting, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty in the order that we uh, bring up the articles for efficiency's sake, but we will have a chance for each one uh, to be heard aloud and then to have uh, questions uh, following it. Uh, so that is uh, the, the, the actual voting uh, for this year is being done uh, by ballot. Um, uh, everyone so in town should have received a ballot uh, in the mail, and that needs to be um, uh, turned in uh, by Tuesday. Uh, so either uh, by mail, uh, dropping it off at the town clerk's office or in the handy uh, secure box that is in front of town hall uh, or uh, dropping it off on uh, election day uh, when there will be P JPs there uh, ready to receive ballots uh, if you are putting it off until the last minute. Uh, so the, uh, the opportunity tonight though is to be able to uh, uh, dive into um, the issues a little more deeply uh, to help inform uh, your voting decisions uh, by Australian ballot. Uh, so before we uh, get started, uh, I, I want to just make a, a couple of quick announcements. Um, uh, well, first of all, uh, we want to recognize uh, uh, Martha McGlynn. Uh, this is her uh, last uh, duty, I think, as a, a longtime select board member uh, who has served uh, this community well and is deeply uh, appreciated. Uh, for that work and service and has chosen not to run again. But thank you, Martha, uh, for, thank for your service. You. Thank you, Matt. It has been my privilege to be on the select board. And I love living in Heartland. So thank you. You bet. Uh, the, other, um, uh, uh, the other thing I want to, to mention is that uh, for those who don't know, uh, a longtime Heartland resident and uh, and member of the select uh, board, Mark Kudermarsh, uh, passed away over the weekend. Um, uh, Gordon had uh, uh, mentioned that we should uh, mention that for folks who had not heard. Um, uh, for those who live on the north end of town, uh, Mark was an institution uh, at the general store, a close, close friend of my parents, in fact. But um, uh, anyway, um, we'll be uh, uh, sorely missed. Um, so. Uh, with that, uh, we are going to um, uh, uh, go through the agenda. The first one uh, is going to be, uh, are there uh, additions or deletions uh, to the agenda? This is an agenda item. We, we are not anticipating any additions or deletions from the agenda, but wanted to uh, see if anyone had any. Uh, Hearing none and not seeing any hands raised, and we'll go into that process uh, in a second, uh, we are going to uh, move on to the uh, legislative uh, update. Uh, so we're going to start off, uh, Cedar, if you would be uh, so kind, I think, uh, oh. John, uh, I, I believe, no, no, J Senator, we got this under control. Um, so uh, I, I'm not sure if John has actually joined us. He is, he is in the gallery, Matt. Oh, he is. Okay. So, Cedar, could you allow uh, John Bartholomew to uh, be able to speak? And he's going to introduce uh, his colleague, uh, Elizabeth Burroughs, uh, who is uh, going to be providing the legislative report on behalf of the House. Yes, please. Rep representative, it's under R, uh, Representative John.
Am I on? You are. Okay, great. Thank you, Matt. Um, I, I just wanted to take an opportunity to introduce my district mate, Elizabeth Burroughs, because it's been so odd the last couple of years. Many of you haven't had an opportunity to meet her. She's the first representative from West Windsor in many years, and she's been doing an outstanding job in her first term in the legislature. So please join me in welcoming Representative Burroughs to our meeting. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, Elizabeth, I'm going to turn it over to you just so that everyone knows. I've asked uh, each of the elected representatives to uh, keep their remarks uh, to five minutes uh, in the interest of the uh, late hour. Uh, and uh, but it's always helpful to hear uh, news from Montpelier. Uh, Representative Burroughs. Thanks, Matt. And uh... Thank you, John, and thank you, Hartland, for the opportunity to come and talk briefly to you tonight. Um, I am Elizabeth Burroughs. John and I represent you at the Vermont State House of Representatives. Uh, as a legislative body, we've been busily working to get the bills of the last two year, or the last bills of the two-year cycle passed through before crossover, which is the part of the session where we consider Senate bills. A lot of work we've done has been on uh, priorities we laid out as a whole body, such as investing in investing Vermont's stimulus funds to boost recovery and set the stage for a strong future, tackling the extremely complex challenges of housing, workforce development, and childcare, enacting inclusive strategies to combat climate change, transition to a sustainable way of life, and prepare for severe weather patterns and address uh, pensions in a way fair for teachers, uh, state workers, and taxpayers. We've had two monumental days in the session this far with passage of not one, but two proposed amendments to our constitution. Um, although Vermont was the first state to ban slavery and indentured servitude, it did not propose uh, prohibit these practices from uh, for individuals 21 years and under. Um, propo proposal two, would amend Article One of the Constitution to provide that slavery and indentured servitude in any form are prohibited. The proposal recognizes and respects the reality of descendants of enslaved Africans brought to this country and the state against their will. Uh, proposal five would enshrine, enshrine reproductive autonomy and liberty into our state's constitution, ensuring that this right is preserved for future generations. And importantly, though, these proposed amendments are now going to be for you to vote upon in November. You are the ultimate decision makers in this process, which are two very important reasons to vote. Um, we've been working on improving equity across our state, including a bill that sets up a process where uh, stakeholders representing people of color, people with disabilities, and indigenous Vermonters will select seven commissioners to begin a truth and reconciliation process. We've got a few education measures coming out, including one creating a youth advisory council that would become part of the governor's agency of administration. And we've been working on investing in a rural landscape through an enormous uh, rural economic omnibus bill. We've worked on economic security and access uh, and access to opportunity through a huge workforce expansion bill led by the Commerce Committee, but with input from everyone else. Um, initiatives addressing workforce shortages in such areas as corrections, education, emergency services, social services, healthcare, and mental health. And speaking of, as a member of the House Committee on Healthcare, I can say that we have approached worker issues in all areas of healthcare, including mental health with all kinds of incentives from pay increases in certain areas to loan repayment, tuition reimbursement, and Medicaid rate increases. We've also put a lot of time into creating a regulatory system for out-of-state providers to provide care uh, via telehealth, which should alleviate some of the pressure on already stretched providers and also addresses some equity issues in the ability of BIPOC and LGBTQ Vermonters to be able to find therapists to, suited to their specific needs. So as I reach the end of my very first biennium, I just wanted to say thank you ever, ever so much for the opportunity to work for you. I've really, really enjoyed it. And I hope you'll contact me anytime you need anything or wanna tell me anything. And the same with John and Thank you so much. It's been a humbling and wonderful two years. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, appreciate it. Over to uh, Senator Clarkson, uh, who will be speaking on behalf of the uh, Windsor County Senate delegation. 
Thank you, Matt. And uh, I'm I, Elizabeth, you did a fabulous job. I mean, you almost did it for all of us. I just have a few things to add. I'm Allison Clarkson. I serve you as one of the three uh, senators for the Windsor District. Uh, Alice Nitka and Dick McCormick, of course, are your other two. And I love this job. I love serving the people of Windsor County, uh, which leads me to one of the first things I'm going to talk about, which is reapportionment. I serve you, though, as a vice chair of Senate Economic Development, uh, Housing and General Affairs, and on the Government Operations Committee. And I also am the majority leader of the Senate and this session am serving on the Senate Reapportionment Committee, which is one of the huge undertakings in addition to passing the, uh, the constitutional amendments with which Elizabeth addressed. Uh, the charge we're given when the census is done every 10 years is that we have to reapportion, redistrict uh, our state uh, so that everybody is equitably represented. And it's a challenge because as you know, a lot of population has shifted to the Northwest. So what we are deep in the middle of that and should have a bill, both our bills, the house is almost set. The Senate will be just behind because we started a little bit later, but it's very thorny. So Windsor County has become very special to me and I having served as a rep, it's great to serve as a Senator and appreciate the difference between serving very in a very focused fashion and serving much more regionally and preserving that and uh, preserving the counties for me is, is, is important. I have really uh, appreciated the difference. Um, the Senate priorities are very similar to what the House's priorities are. All of us are charged with acting on some of the recommendations from the Climate Council. And uh, we're working on that workforce housing and responding to COVID's persistent challenges for Vermonters. Um, <clears throat> we. We are responding also to these in quite important off-session task forces. Uh, Elizabeth mentioned one of them, but the, the pension sustainability one, the education finance one, which is really, really tussled with the equity issue of our waiting formula and the healthcare affordability task force. And all our work this year is uh, enabled by this unprecedented amount of federal COVID recovery money uh, which has flowed th through the feds to us, we have, Vermont has already benefited uh, about $3.56 billion to Vermonters, to Vermont businesses, to Vermont municipalities. It's just astonishing. Um, and the, 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 the investment in projects ranges everything from, from childcare to climate change mitigation, to internet connectivity, uh, as long as it fits into the ARPA guidelines that Treasury has set, we are able to spend it. And we are, uh, it's very exciting. And we are taking full advantage of the luxury of this moment. Uh, I serve on economic development. So I'm just gonna quickly give you a notion of what we're working on there because housing is one of our biggest challenges. It's a priority for both the House and the Senate. Um, and we're working on economic recovery for businesses and workers, both, both pieces, a capital investment bill and uh, housing and workforce, which is beginning in the house, as Elizabeth uh, said. So supporting recovery for our hardest hit businesses, you know, we're all tempted to sort of move forward right now, but actually many of our businesses, particularly in hospitality, the creative sector and uh, special events industry uh, really have, have, have suffered. And we're probably going to finance that next stage in recovery through a, for, a forgivable loan program that uh, the Vermont Economic Develop uh, uh, Development Authority is going to be uh, administering. We're investing in projects with transformative regional impact in our oversubscribed capital investment program. And we're investing in brownfield cleanup, which our, our wonderful Tom Kennedy did a great job today in uh, economic development. Until we can clean up these projects, many of which are in our downtown and village centers, we can't do anything with them. So until we clean them up, they're useless. So we're putting, plowing more money into those, building our relocating worker program, increasing our incredibly successful downtown tax credit program, and supporting our economic, uh, uh, our creative economy. Wages continue to be a real challenge because of COVID. Not unemployment, not long-term unemployment, which is different, but but people who have to take their kids out because of of, of a class having to isolate or or uh, or people who've been exposed at work. We have a lot of people, and this is, you know, this 
COVID has starkly illustrated our need for a paid family medical leave program. And so we are, as you may remember, the governor vetoed that bill two years ago, uh, but we feel we're ready to move forward on this again. Uh, and so we're going to be proposing uh, that in the upcoming months. And I mean, now, but to pass, we hope. Senator, and we're, uh, we're, we're at just about five are minutes. Are we live? Okay, but then I'm sorry. That's okay. We are. It is a meaty, it is a it meaty is, session. There's, there's so much we're doing and uh, I, I would get to housing, but uh, you know, we're, Elizabeth did a great job so that we're, thank you. This was great. You bet. Thank you. Uh, thank you both uh, Senator and Representative uh, for your hard work. I know you're, you're fast at it and uh, deeply appreciate it. All right, so we are going to uh, move on to the uh, articles uh, that are in front of us, and I am going to uh, be reading uh, articles, and then uh, uh, and we are going to be presenting them on the screen so that people can follow along as we go. Uh, and I'm going to read them as if we were in a town uh, town meeting. Uh, uh, and then we will bundle some of these together, as I mentioned, and then have some presentations and then invite uh, questions uh, when we have uh, gotten through those presentations. Um, so the first article one is to elect all town officers required by law. Uh, a town uh, a moderator for the town, one year term, select person three year term, select person two year term, uh, select person one year of a three year term. This is for Curtis who uh, resigned his position. Uh, a lister for a three year term, a library trustee for a three year term and a library trustee for a three year term term, uh, as is the case even during normal times, uh, these will be uh, voted on by Australian ballot uh, and will be uh, and should be um, in the ballot that you have at home. So uh, next, what I'm going to do is go through uh, the uh, uh, any any question. Oh, let me let me uh, a little bit of housekeeping on the best way to engage. Uh, you will notice that at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a small hand and it says raised hand. Uh, if you would like to ask a question uh, of, on, uh, on these articles um, as we are packaging them together, uh, please press uh, raise hand uh, and it will then uh, put you in an order uh, of people raising hands and then I will call on uh, on you, uh, and uh, Cedar from CATV will uh, unmute uh, one at a time. I will also ask you, once you are speaking, uh, to click that raised hand again, which will unraise your hand, and that will uh, allow you to not uh, appear to be asking, uh, looking to ask another question. Uh, so, um, and then we will move orderly through that. Uh, and I will, uh, I believe there is one person uh, who is on the phone. Uh, I will check in after the big articles if, uh, I, I, oh, I believe that's a person who is uh, joining us in order to comment uh, potentially on a uh, specific, uh, on a specific article. Uh, so we will, um, uh, if there's questions on that article, uh, we will ask that individual to participate. Uh, so with all of that said, uh, any any questions on Article One? Okay. Uh, hearing none, uh, I am going to move on to read uh, Articles Two through Five, and then I will turn it over to our town manager uh, to make a presentation on these budget budget items. So. Uh, Article two, uh, shall the voters authorize total general fund and highway fund expenditures of $3,257,328, of which $2,581,404 shall be raised by taxes. Article three, shall the town deposit $50,000 from the general fund surplus to fund the bridge reserve fund. Article four, Shall the voters establish a reserve fund to be called the Culvert Reserve Fund for the purpose of maintaining, upgrading, and upsizing the town's culverts and box culverts in accordance with 24 VSA section 2804 and to make an initial deposit of $100,000 from the general fund surplus to fund this reserve account 
Article 5, shall the voters establish a reserve fund to be called the Fund Balance Reserve Fund in an amount not to exceed 15% of the general and highway fund budget to be used for covering unanticipated revenue shortfalls and to pay non-recurring and unanticipated general and highway fund expenses in accordance with 24 VSA Section 2804 and to make an initial deposit of $314,307 from the general fund surplus to fund this reserve fund. So having read this bundle of budget articles, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave uh, to uh, provide a presentation uh, that should cover these, and then we will take questions uh, that anyone has on any of those articles. Thank you, Matt. So Matt, as you, uh, as, um, you just read uh, in the article, uh, Heartland Select Board is presenting a 2022-2023 overall operating budget of $3,257,328. That is essentially a 5.5% uh, increase over last year. The highest priority uh, for this year's budget, again, uh, is the continued investment in our roads in the highway department. Uh, in the highway fund, we continue to eye the key, key ingredients that go into maintaining our roads. So I've highlighted here two particular line items. Uh, the most um, obvious one is the paving and resurfacing. It's a $30,000 increase over last year. This is similar to last year and over the past four years as we go from $80,000 of which um, we had done for about 10, 12 years um, from uh, late 2000s up to about 2017. Uh, so we made a push to go from $80,000 to $200,000 uh, a year for paving and that's to get to uh, or to accelerate our paving program so that we can essentially catch up from, from where we are. Uh, summer maintenance is the other one thing. And there's a couple of things wrapped up in here. Uh, essentially, there's a net gain of about $10,000 uh, to $12,000, uh, which is for ditching and culvert replacement. And then there's about a $7,000 uh, increase for stone and hard pack, um, primarily hard pack um, out of those two items. Several years now, as I mentioned, uh, with the paving uh, budget trying to go from $80,000 to $200,000. Uh, so several years now, we've been increasing these items. Uh, and why have we increased our investment uh, in the past couple of years? And why in these items? Uh, so uh, I do have some pictures here. Uh, this is very similar to last year. Uh, and this is also very similar to last year's budget. Uh, but it is a familiar story to us. Uh, this is because, as you can see from the following pictures, uh, our assets, particularly our road assets, uh, need attention. This is uh, County Road here. This is Brownsville Road looking out towards, um, as it's, you're heading to West Windsor. This match should look familiar to you. This is very famous portion of Clay Hill Road. This is Queechy Road here. This is a segment of Gilson Road and I'll get to ditching in a minute, but you can also see ditching uh, or need of ditching on the left-hand side here. You can actually see kind of the pavement kind of falling off to the left, but um, that is in need of repayment and actually some re construction underneath as well. This is Mount Hunger Road. And this is uh, uh, Bowers Road, actually. These are some of the busiest places or the busiest roads that we have, uh, and they're in pretty rough shape. Uh, this is imperative or it's imperative that we be able to pave more than what we have been paving historically. 
That's why we've upped it or continue to up the paving budget um, to where we have. Uh, and again, the impetus for the $30,000 increase this year. Ditching is also an important component to the roads. Uh, ditching is not unlike our paving. Uh, you can see uh, ditch lines almost on every road, uh, but a lot of places they need to be reestablished. They too need to be maintained or we lose them. Plus in most cases uh, or places, they are required by law. For instance, in the town of Heartland, we have 35 miles of state mandated hydro connected segments. And what a hydro connected segment is, is much like you see this picture here, there is a stream uh, essentially going underneath Mace Hill Road here. So anytime you get a segment of roadway that is in the vicinity of a stream, uh, it becomes what's called a hydro connected segment. And uh, we are required to maintain our ditching within these segments. Uh, we have 35 miles of them. 15 miles have been identified by the state of Vermont as in the need of being repaired. Uh, and we have 15 years to do it. So that's one mile a year. <clears throat> so other than just being mandated by the state of Vermont, why is it good to do ditching? Well, here, um, uh, this is Town Farm Road. Um, the water, as you can see on the left-hand side of the road here, water pretty much tells us why. Water, if it's not channeled properly, uh, will cause erosion. Again, this is Town Farm Road as well. Uh, again, the water is almost telling us uh, where the work needs to be done. Uh, you can see um, this is in need of ditching. We have done some repair on uh, the other side of this for culvert work. Uh, but again, it, it, um, after a while or after a heavy rainstorm, it becomes obvious almost as to what's going on with the road and why we need to um, maintain our ditching. Same situation here. Uh, I believe this is Best Road. And then this is also Best Road. Uh, you can see, kind of see to the right that there uh, was ditching or has been ditching at one point in time. Uh, however, you can see that there's kind of a mound. Again, this is just to the right of the paving. Uh, there's a little bit of a mound uh, or a berm uh, that's not allowing the water to shut off the road. And you can see between this berm and the road, how the, the water is just eating into the pavement. It's kind of gnawing away at uh, the base of the pavement. Um, there's other things going on here, as you can see the cracking in the center of the road. But again, uh, you can see what not having the proper ditching, what it does to the roads and why we need to maintain it. When we do have good ditching, uh, it helps the quality of the road immensely. Uh, water sheds from the crown. Uh, this road you can see used to be problematic for us. It's in very good shape. Uh, these pictures were taken at the same time of the year. Um, having a good crown, uh, allowing the water to kind of shed off to the side of the roadway, uh, reduces erosion. Uh, the water um, as it runs along those, the, the grass and the stone, it gets filtered. So when the water does find its way to the stream, it's much cleaner. Uh, the, the silt and the sediment gets left behind. This is Webster Road. We did this a couple of years back now. Uh, this used to be an extremely problematic section for us. Uh, again, it's in good shape here. Uh, again, uh, you got a crown with the water going off into the ditching area. Again, kind of um, closest to us in the picture, you, you can't see it, but it does enter into kind of a, a stream-like area. Again, as that water comes down across that rock and, and grass, it kind of gets filtered. That's really what the state is looking for. 
But again, it's a dual purpose because the road itself, uh, you don't have that erosion alongside of the road. You've got the ditching in a controlled area, uh, allowing the road surface to, you know, essentially maintain a proper surface and stay in good shape. Uh, the last item I mentioned um, that we, uh, a couple of things in the budget, but again, uh, the paving, uh, the ditching and culverts, um, also the stone is an increase. Stone is an important component to the road. It provides kind of a base to it. Otherwise you just basically have dirt and mud. Uh, we do have different sizes of stone. Uh, what you don't see here is the seven inch stone that we use in the ditching or in the, the very sub base of the road. Uh, but you can see this picture here again. This is, you know, last year at about this time. Uh, you see uh, stone in the road here providing a nice base. Otherwise, this would be mud, uh, would be very difficult to travel. Um, again, maintaining its structure and allowing us to essentially maintain a crown and, and allow cars to pass. The hard pack is what goes over essentially the last picture, uh, the last picture would ultimately would get hard pack once it thaws out a little bit. Hard pack is a critical component because it goes over the top of the surface. Uh, again, it's about three inch stone. Uh, however, it does gel together, particularly when it's driven on or compacted. Uh, and that's what makes for a driving, a smooth driving surface um, and you know, alleviates the road from potholes. But again, uh, you know, it's good to have the hard pack, but you need to have the crown and then you need to have proper ditching. This road happens to have some berms alongside of the road. But um, again, uh, when you put those components together, it makes for a good road. And with the paved roads, uh, again, you need the ditching uh, because otherwise, as you saw on Best Road, uh, if you don't have the proper ditching, it will undermine the pavement uh, and creates problems. The general fund. So that was the highway fund. Uh, again, our two primary funds uh, on the town side is the general fund and the highway fund. General fund is actually the bigger of the two. I've highlighted here a couple areas of note. Uh, kind of, if you were to look at just a couple of things in the budget, what to look at. First one, total assessment. Uh, $20,000 increase there. What that is, is essentially the three corners intersection project. Our first bond payment will kick in in fiscal year 23. So uh, we do need to budget for that and uh, we will have that going forward for the next 20 years. <clears throat> the town clerk's office, uh, I've got this highlighted. Uh, there is an $11,000 increase. Uh, although it is offset on the revenue side, um, essentially with some ARPA grant monies uh, because most, well, half of this is essentially for next year in case. And again, it, it, if we don't use it, then we won't need to bring the money over on the revenue side. But um, a big part of this increase is for elections in case we have the pandemic still with us and we need to go through this process again the milling of the ballots and um, you know, some of the other items that we need to do to set up for an Australian ballot uh, in a uh, vote from home uh, does cost money. Actually wasn't budgeted this year. Uh, we put it in next year as a just in case, but um, if you're looking at the budget, it does stick out. Rec program is about $17,000 increase. Uh, however, um, we brought those expenses down the last couple of years because our programs have been kind of running on half of a cylinder due to the pandemic. Uh, even though in the clerk's office, we're kind of a just in case planning for the pandemic again next year. In the rec program, we are planning on uh, hopefully going back to all cylinders because we hope to come out of this um, pandemic, in which case we'd be running our programs at full speed, in which case our staffing a little bit, be a little bit more, the operations expense of, um, you know, bringing the kids around would be more 
Uh, there's not any one thing in that rec program budget, if you were to look at that independently, that sticks out. Just to kind of everything um, is beefed up a little bit, knowing that hopefully we're back uh, at full, full tilt. Buildings and grounds really is the only new thing uh, in the general fund. And it's really a $12,000 thing. And it is for a summer person, uh, which would um, help with our buildings and grounds, particularly with the cemeteries and Sumner's Falls. We really don't have staffing to get over to Sumner's Falls and uh, the staffing that we do gets pulled by the cemeteries. Uh, we do the cemeteries only maybe three times a year at Tops and it's maybe two weeks uh, um, at a time that we get pulled to do it. They certainly need to be done more than three times uh, a year. And we just can't pull our buildings and grounds person off for more than what we do. So we're looking at mowing the cemeteries more and hopefully getting over to Sumner's Falls and being able to clean that up more and also do a little bit more work around Courier Park and Foster Meadows more than what our contracted lawnmower person does. So um, that is, is an addition, it's a $12,000 addition to the general fund. Last thing kind of of note, um, we did uh, boost the oil and propane um, budget items by about 20% due to what we foresee as inflation. We're already kind of there at the 20%. Uh, we don't see it getting much better next year. And then the other big item that affects both the general fund and the highway fund is employee wages. Uh, we give a cost of living increase to our employees based upon a consumer price index. Consumer price index is just basically a measure of inflation. This year, it really uh, jumped um, from what you can see last year was at about one. Uh, this year is about 4.6%. It's actually at 4.6%. Uh, so we based our cost of living increase on that. So um, the employee wages have a built in cost of living increase of 4.6% to essentially mimic um, essentially what inflation is doing uh, outside with food and, and gas and other items. So again, we're looking at about a 5.5% increase. Uh, that is about a 5.61% increase to your tax rate. You can see uh, the different um, values of your house. Uh, the first one there is $100,000 valuation, translates into uh, $617.80, 32, $33 difference over last year. Uh, it goes $200,000, $300,000 valuation. Uh, we've been using a $250,000 valuation as kind of the average valuation in, in Heartland. Uh, so you'd be looking at about an $82 uh, difference over last year um, in the taxes that you would pay on the town side. So Along with Article 2, Matt also read Article 3, 4, and 5. Uh, and that addresses essentially surplus monies that we have in the general fund. Uh, literally through good fortune and some lucky bounces. Uh, there's not any real one thing uh, I can put my finger on that has created the surplus. Uh, you know, other than just simply how we budget, we budget very conservatively. So if we're estimating how something is gonna cost or what it's gonna cost, we estimate on the high side of that estimate. And if we're looking at revenues and what we think we might come in for revenues, we budget on the lower side. And uh, there are times where uh, those cost estimates don't come in as high. And there's times where the revenue estimates come in a little bit better. Uh, but literally things such as, uh, you know, if an employee turns over and we go three, four months before we hire a new employee, you know, that's kind of a, it's not a benefit to us because we have to work through it, but it's a benefit to, uh, you know, the budget. Uh, if the pandemic, um, ironically, was kind of good to the 
rec department. Um, expenses were less, um, but revenues didn't dip as much as expenses and, and provided a benefit to the budget. Um, so it's literally been kind of bits and pieces, uh, literally here and there. Not more than here and there, but uh, here and there each year. So we've proposed to do three things uh, with that surplus money. We had a bridge reserve fund. Uh, it has not been uh, funded since I've been here. I think it was funded uh, at some point prior to me. Uh, so I've gone at least four years without it, five years without funding it. Looking to put $50,000 into that fund uh, with surplus monies, bringing that from $50,000 to $100,000. Uh, we had, uh, or we put together a roads committee, uh, which also helped put together the goal for our paving at $200,000. But this roads committee um, was finished its work maybe three years ago. And part of that work was um, acknowledging that we have uh, box culverts and culverts. Um, box culverts are fairly expensive to replace, or about 200 grand. Uh, we really didn't have anything in place in case we, you know, one broke tomorrow. Um, you know, where's that money going to come from? So it was a recommendation to that committee that we actually fund a reserve fund upwards to $200,000 for that purpose. So we've taken uh, $100,000 of the surplus. We're proposing to put it towards that culvert reserve fund. And then lastly, uh, the remaining part of that money is to essentially go to what's called a fund balance reserve fund. So things have been good for us. We've had some lucky bounces. Those bounces can also go the other way. Uh, it happened in 2017 with the, the very large rainstorms that we had. Happened with um, Hurricane Irene. Uh, you can wake up tomorrow. Um, you know, or the wind tonight can blow something over and we need money to deal with it. Uh, and so the remaining amount we are um, requesting the voters to vote on putting in a fund balance reserve fund. Therefore, if something occurs that creates a deficit, which can very easily happen, then the money in the reserve fund, the fund balance reserve fund comes over to kind of fill the gap in the deficit, all of which in my mind stabilizes the tax rate, keeps things consistent uh, so that we don't need to go back to the taxpayers uh, and ask for money in case something big comes up. That's it, Matt. Thank you, Dave. Uh, excellent. Um, so we are going to take uh, questions as uh, folks have raised their hand. Uh, Cedar, if you wouldn't mind keeping people off uh, on mute until uh, they're called upon, um, just so that we don't have background noise that comes in. Uh, and the first person who I believe uh, raised her hand was uh, Pat Richardson. So Pat, if you want to unmute yourself, feel free to ask a question. Thank you, Matt. Um, I have a question about the reserve funds in Articles 2 or Articles 3, 4, and 5. Excellent. Are, are, are these like the uh, typical reserve funds? That is, uh, use of them requires voter approval before expenditure once they're established? So on the bridge and the um, on the bridge and the culvert reserve fund will require voter approval. On the fund balance reserve fund, it will be select board, um, basically select board um, choice, but the choice is narrow, Pat, in that it can only fill the gap of really a, um, a deficit. So if you're spending, if you overspend in a particular year, then that money is essentially going to slide over. Uh, and if you don't, uh, I think the wording says is that the, the fund balance would be 
funded upwards to 15% of the combined general fund, highway fund budget. So, you, you know, you're capped at how much money you're going to put in this. Uh, and it, it really acts as if uh, it's your equity or your fund balance, but you're essentially asking the voters to uh, maintain that, um, you know, kind of year after year so that it's there. It is up to the select board, Pat, but it's really narrow and um, will basically almost automatically slide over if there's a deficit. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Uh, so the next person up is is Heather. Uh, Heather, if you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question, please. Hi, thanks a lot. Um, <clears throat> my name is Heather Staliga, and I have a question um, about the projected 5.5 increase on the town side. Once we add in um, the school side, What's going to be the total increase for taxpayers? Uh, I can't answer that, Heather, because I'm only responsible for the town side. <laughs> but I will go out of my way to it's not an equal 5.5% versus 6%. So let's just say the schools a 6% increase and the towns a 5.5 and therefore you're automatically going to get an 11.5% increase. Mm -hmm. The town is only 20% of your tax bill. So the 5.5% is only 20% of, you know, your overall again, your tax bill. So we're a 5.5% increase over the 20% of your tax bill of, of last year for the town. Uh, I get a lot of people, uh, I'm just going to take this moment, Heather, <laughs> put this out there because it's amazing how many phone calls I get. Uh, you know, people speaking loudly at me that, um, you know, the roads uh, or potholes or, or whatever is less than ideal. Uh, so I just got finished saying that the general fund is actually the bigger fund of the two. So the highway funds is only um, about 10%. Uh, it's less than 10% of your tax bill. So all other taxes, the, the remaining 10 and a half, 11 percent uh, on the tax side, and then 79 to 80 percent is on the school. So you'd actually have to put the two side by side together uh, in order to do that. I haven't done that, Heather. I'm sorry. Uh, OK, uh, I was just going to ask you if you've done that. <clears throat> Uh, could you do it? It's not, I mean, you couldn't, I'm not putting you on the spot, but could you do that at some point? Hello? Yes, I, I didn't quite hear. I, I think she asked if you could do that at some point, not right now necessarily. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Heather, where that would be shared, uh, but. Um, I, I believe the increases, if I recall correctly, uh, are individually articulated in the uh, uh, on the ballot for the school. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it actually talks about the actual increase uh, on the school uh, ballot, and then uh, uh, Dave um, uh, appropriately shared in his presentation uh, what the um, tax impact will be on the town side. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would, if, if you if you bring those two together, I don't think this exact question came up last night at the informational meeting uh, for the school. Uh, as as Dave mentioned, uh, uh, the school is a, a larger proportion of your total um, uh, your your total uh, tax uh, obligation. Um, but that that that's how I would put the, I think one would put those together. Yeah, Matt. Last thing I'll add is. Um... Uh, we do do that, Heather, but we do it later in the spring because, and maybe they touched on this last night, but the tax rate for the school actually comes from the state of Vermont. 
So we end up getting uh, sent to us what the tax rate for the Heartland school system is going to be. And then we put that together um, with the town one and, and do that kind of calculation. You know, we can maybe kind of come close prior to, and we can maybe talk about that, Heather, but um, I, I'm not sure everybody's aware of that either, that it comes from the state and that's kind of, that's the ultimate calculation that we use. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is related to how much we spend, right? There is a, there is a relationship there, but the state does, uh, uh, does make the final determination, particularly on the statewide uh, property tax rate um, as, and the other uh, factor is the common level of appraisal, uh, which is related to how, uh, how far off our valuations are uh, from what is perceived as the actual market value. Uh, and that's going to affect, affect the tax rate uh, as, as well. Uh, I'm going to move on. If people have follow-up questions, they're welcome to raise their hand again. And we'll just, uh, we will address individuals who are uh, who have not asked a question yet first, uh, and then happy to take uh, follow-on questions. Uh, next person up is Chuck Fenton. Uh, if you would like to unmute yourself. Um, Thank you. Yes, this is Chuck Fenton speaking. And I have a question regarding Article 5. Chuck, there is some, there's some odd uh, feedback. Sorry. Uh, is that better? No. No? Sorry. Um, right, well, we'll, we'll, we'll endure, um, but if you could just go right on mute after you, you, you ask the question. because it. Um, sure. Yeah. My question is about Article 5, and I'm concerned about comments the town manager made during the February 7th select board meeting where he indicated that the cost overruns on the Three Corners intersection project were a major concern I'm sure we can understand that because of inflation. And speaking at that meeting, he said the highway reserve fund, which relates to Article 5, I believe, would be the critical backstop for funding the cost overruns on the Three Corners intersection project. That is recorded on CATV, the, the uh, February 7th meeting at 1 hour 46 minutes and 30 seconds. Back in 2020, two years ago, there was discussion of how cost overruns on this project would be paid and would the board have to return to ask the voters for additional funds for that project. So an example of cost overruns is the $65,000 for trees that the state now requires Heartland to pay for that were not in the original budget, plus of course the cost of caring for those trees. So my question is, in reviewing Article 5, it asks for an additional amount of $314,307 to be used for, in quotes, unanticipated general and highway fund expenses. So will this fund, as the town manager stated on February 7th, will this fund be the target for covering the unanticipated cost overruns on the Three Corners intersection project? And is this article, Article 5, the point at which the board is returning to the voters to approve cost overruns for the Three Corners intersection project? Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. And if you put it on mute, um, just because the feedback is still. Thank you. OK. Uh, Dave, I believe that is uh, directed to you. So. Long story short is no, uh, Article 5 has nothing to do uh, with that, Chuck. Um, Article 5 pertains to general fund monies and the general fund surplus, uh, which we have built over the last five years, um, at which point it used to have a deficit. Uh, highway fund also has a surplus, which, um, has been there for several years. Um, we, by statute, don't deal with the highway fund surplus like we need to deal with the general fund surplus. General fund surplus, we need to um, 
essentially ask the voters what to, to do with it. And we're proposing to do exactly that, put it in a fund balance reserve fund uh, in case we run a deficit at some point in time. If, and it's an if, uh, the Three Corners Intersection Project overruns its budget, then I would look towards the highway fund surplus monies to, as a resource to backstop uh, any overruns on the Three Corners Intersection Project. But, but you, when you listen to those discussions, Chuck, you need to listen to the entire conversation. Um, so I am concerned about overruns and I think that any reasonable manager would be, and I think it's reasonable for us to be talking about what would happen if there was an overrun. But as we pointed out at that same February 7th, uh, actually it was at the um, candidates night, uh, we talked about this and it was pointed out that the contingency is essentially still there. Uh, the, with that increase that you talked about with the trees, um, that contingency is not a full 15%. At this point in time, it may be about a 12%. So we're encroaching upon that contingency, but essentially the bulk of that contingency is still in place. Uh, you know, but however, you know, look, the market is tight. Uh, resources are more expensive than they used to be. Uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, have factored in some of those costs, Chuck, and the contingency mainly is there. But I think that any reasonable town would talk about what to do if there's cost overruns. And um, that's in place um, at, at the moment. But it has nothing to do with the monies that we're talking about for Article 5. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Uh, are there uh, additional questions on Articles 2 through 5, uh, which are the articles related to the budget and the various general fund, uh, 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 sorry, the Bridge Reserve Fund, the Culvert Reserve Fund, and the Fund Balance Reserve Fund. Okay, uh, seeing none, I just want to double check that the person who is, oh no, it's the one person on the phone who's not, I don't believe a resident of Heartland. Um, so it's it's okay uh, when that person when the uh, uh, article comes up uh, if the, anyone has questions uh, that person can uh, chime in. Okay, uh, we're going to move on then to Article Six. Uh, I'm just going to read this and then we're going to uh, turn it over to uh, John. Uh, San I'm sorry, we're going to do Article Six. We're also going to do Article Fifteen and Article Sixteen. Uh, so we're going to be uh, covering uh, somewhat out of order each of the articles that have to do with uh, fire and safety. Uh, so uh, Article 6 is, shall the voters authorize the purchase of a forestry truck for the Heartland Fire Department in an amount not to exceed $172,585 to be funded by the Heartland Volunteer Fire Department capital reserve account. Then skipping to article 15, shall the town vote to appropriate uh, $14,500 to support the Heartland Rescue Squad. The Heartland Rescue Squad provides a rapid response and emergency care on scene while awaiting ambulance transport. And then article 16, shall the town vote to appropriate 73,000 to support the Heartland Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, the Heartland Volunteer Fire Department provides fire protection and emergency services for the town of Heartland. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, John Sanders uh, to uh, provide a presentation uh, that will cover all uh, three of these items. I know uh, Alan Beebe is also uh, available for questions on the Heartland rescue side, 
uh, if folks have questions uh, specific to that article. John. Thanks, Matt. I'm gonna share my screen and get right to the slides here. Okay, folks can see our beautiful Heartland Volunteer Fire Department and Rescue Squad. Yes, thank you. So um, I was joking with the Escutney Fire Chief who somehow snuck his fire engine into our town meeting slides over here. But um, this is a good chunk of our Heartland Volunteer Fire Department and Rescue Squad parked in front of our station one, uh, right next to the town garage not to be confused with the Cootermarsh station uh, up at, uh, or station two up in North Heartland, who uh, we pay our respects to tonight for the loss over the weekend. Um, we were established in 1948. We are all volunteer, both the fire department and the rescue squad. And uh, we have a secretary position um, and that, that position is paid uh, very modestly for uh, just uh, support and entering of data. Um, these are our current, uh, Fire department members, we have 32 fire department members. Um, the folks that are new in the last couple of years, I have highlighted in yellow. Um, Alan's wife, Kim Beebe, um, is on the rescue squad and she's joined us uh, as a secretary to take over the secretary position. Um, our officers are on the top. Uh, I'm your volunteer fire chief. I think folks know Scott Bowers, who's also our assistant chief and fire warden. Uh, Zach Wood um, has been our captain for uh, the last year or two, and uh, he has just announced uh, that he's going to be moving north and uh, starting a family. So that is a position we're going to be filling uh, in a June volunteer uh, fire department vote. Alan Beebe and Jason Berry are filling our lieutenant positions right now. We have nine of our firefighters are also on the rescue squad and are trained at at least the EMT level, um, and I'll go over that in a minute. Um, and last year, uh, the year before last, uh, the last time we presented this, we had discussed uh, 134 calls, and I'll show you that we've gone up a little bit. Um, so Kim Beebe is a new member. Cooper Clay is a new member. Cody Harrington and Shannon Harness are new members. Um, River Miriam, uh, Jaden Sanborn, Richard Stockwell, Ryan Tefner, and uh, forgive me, but Lydia, um, snuck off the page here and she's uh, hiding hiding over on the side. I don't know if you can see her there down here. So Lydia Wood also joined us and I was not enough of an engineer to squeeze her onto the page. So I, she fell off. Um, Cody, Lydia, um, and uh, uh, Spencer, um, I believe, uh, all took the Firefighter One course. And uh, myself, uh, Cody, and Lydia are also in the active Firefighter 2 uh, Vermont Fire Academy course going on at our station right now. Uh, this is a, the chart that I put up every year. Uh, in gold is sort of the miscellaneous calls, the wires down, the traffic issues, um, appliance concerns, odor investigations, public assist, medical assist kinds of fire department calls. The blue calls, are um, crashes. And uh, this year I was unable to differentiate the way that uh, the dispatch gave me the information. I was able, unable to dis differentiate the interstate accidents from the uh, in-town crashes. Uh, but we tend to do about two thirds of our uh, crashes are on the interstate and about a third of them are in town. And you can see that historically. And then the rest of our call volume in red is, um, is fires of some, some type, whether that's a smoke detector going off, a carbon monoxide detector, a chimney fire, uh, illegal burn, brush fire, odor, uh, smoke investigation, that, that kind of thing. Um, so you can see that we're up uh, just a hair higher than back in 2017, um, but no obvious trends here, just generally up a little bit. This is our rescue squad, and I'm going to go through this and get to the end and um, offer Alan a chance to speak at the end of this if, if there are questions for the rescue squad. Uh, we currently respond, as, as Matt said in the, in the article, we are a rapid response group. Um, we don't do patient transport. We work with a contract ambulance service through Windsor, Woodstock, and Hartford. Um, we did 280 calls um, in two, 2020. And I'll show you in a slide in a minute just how many calls we did this past year. 
Uh, we were really fortunate to have three paramedics, Alan Beebe, um, Sean Hannix, and Keith Morse um, are all uh, full-time paramedics um, outside of Heartland and, and do a great job um, under Alan's leadership with the rescue squad. And uh, we have 10 uh, overall medical responders. Nine of them are on the fire department as well. And James uh, or Jim Armbruster is the, uh, also our animal control person in Heartland and is on our rescue squad. Uh, J James is also running uh, with the Woodstock ambulance crew. So you may be familiar to some of you in that way too. Uh, you can see a definite trend going on with the rescue calls. Um, in, in 2021, we did almost, almost 300 calls. Um, so that's getting pretty close to one a day. Um, and uh, a lot of people ask me questions about what kind of calls are these, what's causing the increase, and it's hard to answer uh, that um, other than it's just been, it's, it's been active this year. And maybe Alan can uh, put some, some sense to that, but um, it's hard to classify these like we do the fire department um, without divulging too much information. Um, just a recap of 2021, uh, we've been pretty active with, uh, uh, with Alan being the lead instructor for the Vermont Fire Academy's Firefighter 1 and 2 course hosted here in Heartland. Um, we made a convertible out of four or five cars down in the town pit and practiced with uh, re rescue extrication tools um, on a nice, I think it was uh, somewhat um, just a little bit below zero on this day when we were all doing this. Um, we had a, a ventilation um, sort of Art of uh, reading smoke and and uh, understanding how fire travels in a in a simulated structure. Um, Alan did a great job discussing, um, you know, how smoke travels, safe ways to enter, um, and, and things like that. Thank you very much. Um, and then uh, some of you may remember on uh, Halloween, we uh, we set up our engine one. Um, down by Bischoff Lane and Route 12, and we helped a little bit with uh, traffic control and tried to make that a little safer uh, operation this year. We were very busy with uh, fire prevention at the elementary school. That's sort of a whirlwind of uh, trying to get uh, over 250 kids through some basic uh, fire prevention training. Uh, uh, we took the year off last year from doing this because of COVID, and we were able to do it uh, safely this year in, uh, in the uh, the Cathogematorium, I think is what they call it down there at the school. Um, and uh, we did have an event uh, the, the day that Santa Claus was um, all seat belted into the front of our engine and ready to go do a grand tour of Heartland. We got uh, a whole bunch of really greasy snow and uh, the call started rolling in and we had to uh, ask Santa to step down from our engine. And I think we left some people pretty uh, disappointed uh, standing on street corners in Heartland. So my apologies on his behalf, uh, but it was my fault because I asked him to step down and uh, we ended up going out to three calls in a row um, and we were actually rear ended on, uh, on, on the interstate. Uh, you can hear my voice shaking a little bit because I really hate the interstate. It's, uh, it's a really dangerous place. So uh, nobody got hurt um, and we really, we really went away with just a scratch on that. So I was, I was pretty happy. Um, we did have uh, our backup generator has come online several times this year. Uh, we've been able to keep the class going through a few power outages and it's been really nice to have that emergency generator available for both the fire department and the uh, town garage. That's been a great addition. Um, a, a quick review on our apparatus. Our newest piece of apparatus is up at, um, at station two. It's a tanker truck. It carries 2000 gallons of water. Um, and it's parked right next to our, our uh, engine two, which is also up in, up in North Heartland. And uh, our tanker two is uh, basically brand new. It's four years old. Um, it's hard to believe it's already four years old. Um, our engine, our first two engine um, is uh, seven years old. Our tanker one, which is uh, parked in station one and carries 1500 gallons of water on wheels is 10 years old. It's a, roughly halfway through its estimated life. Um, engine two is um, 17 years old. It came to us um, as a demo. So I think it had a few years on it when we received it. And we're estimating a lifetime of 23 years. So we still have another um, six years or, or so uh, to go. And there's probably a little bit of wiggle room on exactly when we choose to replace that. But our forestry is um, right at the end of its uh, estimated life. And it's 22 years old. It also came to us used with some miles on it and some years behind it. 
and um, it's operating okay. It still has uh, value, um, and uh, it will uh, likely be traded in uh, as part of our upgrade to a new forestry truck. And uh, this next slide, I think, talks about what that might look like. Um, I slid in here at the top. Our proposed budget for the overall operating expenses of the fire department is seventy-three thousand dollars. That's up. Uh, I just I just upped it a little bit, two point two percent from seventy-one thousand four hundred, which is our current operating budget. Um, we're really just trying to account for um, a couple of line items that are are going up, and uh, I don't have it at my fingertips exactly which ones, but it's uh, we're basically making incremental adjustments. Um, this is probably not uh, conservative enough of an adjustment, um, having just learned that turnout gear is going up almost 30%, um, which is, uh, it's gonna, I have a feeling we're gonna be eating into our, um, our, our sort of donation um, options when we uh, get to the end of this year, just to cover our newest members with some new turnout gear. So um, this, is a, this is a very slight increase um, and, uh, you know, Maybe we should have gone more, but it's hard to understand uh, when material prices are going to start coming back down again, if they are. Um, just to talk about the forestry truck for a minute, um, we, we have a committee formed. We've met um, a handful of times. We've, we've sort of decided that what we have as a forestry truck now has worked well, uh, but we'd like to potentially carry a little bit more gear on it um, and improve the ground clearance on a little bit. Um, we'd like to add a winch to the front and possibly to the rear. We'd like to use slide up compartments. Um, and uh, uh, there were some other kind of wishes, but basically it's a light, it's, it's a kind of a heavy duty util utility vehicle with a pump on the back of it. That's four wheel drive that we can get up those driveways that we just can't get up with the fire trucks. And uh, it gives us initial attack for um, brush fires. It'll be our primary for fire for doing brush fires. But it's also sort of that that truck that should be able to get up anything um, when those driveways just aren't passable by our bigger trucks. Um, so this is these are two different notional um, views of what we're looking at. Um, we've talked. We, we did get three different quotes, and the article is written to cover the middle quote, um, which happens to be a local vendor in uh, Cornish. Um, but the uh, there are, there are two other quotes that we're also considering and we haven't completely uh, settled on, a, on exact uh, which vendor we're gonna go to and, and, and we're waiting for the town approval to proceed. Um, we do hear through all of our vendors that um, once we place the order, um, plan to wait at least a year for the truck chassis to arrive and then the truck can be built out after that. So um, the money that we're asking for for this is sitting in a capital reserve account already. It's not a tax impact because we have been setting aside with, together with the select board and the town manager. We've been slowly putting money into that capital fire department capital reserve account with known purchases of our um, of our fire trucks. So we're strategically putting money in to cover this sort of cascade of new of known new truck purchases every five to six years. Um, and uh, what else was I going to say on that? I think that's, I think that's about it. Um, the next do, um, as I covered in the previous slide, is going to be our Engine 2 in North Heartland. Um, that's a much more expensive truck. Um, we're, we are estimating it roughly in the $300,000 ballpark. Um, our Engine 1, which is our primary do, that's seven years old. Uh, I believe that was a four hundred and uh, 400 or $420,000 fire truck. Um, it carries a full crew of six, where our engine through two is a carries a crew of two or three, so it's a slightly smaller cab. Um, and then uh, we also look at our um, capital reserve account and other large expenses um, when we might consider something like an expensive furnace replacement uh, both at both of the stations. This has been on there for the last few slides. Um, we feel like it's coming. But um, I think we're we're continuing to get good life out of the existing furnaces, and so we haven't haven't pulled the trigger on it yet. Um, this is uh, just a couple of slides with reminders. Um, we've been having a, a bit of a hard time recently on some specific roads with the nine one one addresses. Uh, we've been called to uh, not to to addresses that aren't posted, um, addresses that are posted 
way up a driveway on the garage and you have to be at the house before you know that you're at the right address. Um, and we've had some addresses that were just um, wrong. And um, Sean, I'm gonna get his name wrong, McGranigan. Dave will fix me on that later. Sean is our um, ordinance administrator and uh, he's doing a great job reaching out, um, working with me to um, correct those as we find them. And uh, we're trying to do better. So if you see Sean or us walking around trying to figure out who lives where, um, we're just trying to help the emergency responders get to where they're supposed to be going. Um, we've Once again, we've had um, carbon monoxide and smoke detectors go off this year. Um, we've responded and there really has been carbon monoxide in the house and it's been at dangerous levels. Those really do save lives. If you don't have one operating in your house, um, it's really just a matter of time. So please, uh, please put up a CO detector and a smoke detector. It's a, it's a really big deal and it will save your life. Um, please do call for burn permits. Uh, we spend a lot of time leaving our families behind and going looking for illegal burns or um, people burning that didn't know they needed a permit because we think a house is on fire. So this is a common courtesy to call and get a permit through the town. On the weekends, you can call any of the fire officers. That information is available on the internet uh, through the town uh, website. Um, I always like to say in March that brush fire season is just around the corner. Uh, we had a pretty good melt today. Uh, more snow coming this weekend, but um, once that snow melts, everything's really dry underneath and we go into a spring brush fire season and we want people to be really, really careful. Um, more and more folks are going to this website and ordering uh, Knox boxes for their home. Um, these are like uh, bank vault type keys that the fire department has very carefully controlled access to. We have to enter social security numbers to remove our key from a vault and that is logged in time so that we know who has the key and when for how long. And we can use that key if you buy one of these systems, you can put a house key inside of this vault and we can use our key to get to your key and we can get into your house without breaking any windows or taking down any doors in the event of an emergency. So if, you, uh, if, you, if you're interested in this, you can go to this website um, and, uh, or you can Google Knox um, as in Fort Knox um, box and, and uh, you can actually enter the Heartland Volunteer Fire Department and you can order yourself a box like this to slip over your door or a more industrial box like what you see on the town buildings uh, and the bank and stuff like that. Um, we do need more volunteers. Um, we have, uh, I will say that we have all of our cubbies full with turnout gear right now, um, but that doesn't mean that we have all the responders that we need when the, when the alarm goes off. I'm really excited that um, we've had so many people go through, uh, in Heartland, go through the Fire Academy course and uh, a lot of towns around us going through that course as well. I'm glad we were able to host it. Um, it's been a great experience. Um, you have to be over 18 if you want to be on the fire department. It is a pretty large time commitment. We try to get people down to the fire department at, at least every other week. Um, and then all the responses and training that goes along with that. There are lots of ways to help. You don't just have to stand out on the interstate or um, want to go running into burning buildings. There's lots of ways to help um, and we could use some help if you're interested. So please come find me. Um, lastly, I've put this slide up in the past, just a reminder that um, in the United States, over 70% of the firefighters are volunteers, um, but that's about 815,000 out of the 1.2 million. Um, we're not the only local fire department struggling to meet staffing needs. Uh, Bernie Sanders had a nice town meeting discussion about this uh, that a few of our firefighters attended. Uh, there are some other departments, uh, other towns having even uh, more issues than, than we are. So I'm grateful for the staff that we have. Um, our firefighters are getting older, myself included. Um, and so it's nice to see some young blood when we can get it. Um, volunteer firefighters and emergency medical technicians across the country. Um, it's um, you have to meet national training standards these days, so it's, it's, it's getting to be um, time intensive to do the training. Um, there's a, lot, lot amount of, a large amount of time uh, that's needed to commit to your community to do this. Um, and uh, the equipment that we need to use is uh, expensive um, for good reason, but uh, it's, it's, it's uh, both medical and firefighting equipment is getting really, very, really very expensive. And then the scary fact at the end, every 24 seconds, the fire department responds to a fire somewhere in the nation. So again, 
get those smoke detectors up and uh, protect yourself. Um, I'll stop sharing. And um, Alan Beebe, I'll just uh, reach out to you if you have anything you wanted to contribute or if there's any questions I would pick them. Cedar, if you could take uh, Alan Beebe uh, off mute, in case he wants to add anything. Uh, if, if you could uh, take Alan Beebe off uh, mute, in case he wants to add anything uh, to the presentation. I think I'm there. Hey, Alan. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, John, great job. Um, you know, the only thing I'd want to add is, is the rescue squad. Our calls are going up every year. Uh, the volunteers, as you see, the numbers are staying about the same. If anybody's interested in being an EMT, we have a class coming up in Thetford starting in March. I'd like to throw that out there. It is a big time commitment like John talks about. So kudos to the fire department personnel and the rescue squad personnel because to stay certified, well, initially you got to take a 180 hour course just to get certified. You don't get paid for any of that stuff. Uh, and then all the continuing education is anywhere between 30 to 50 hours a year that each, especially if you're combined fire and EMS. So that's all in their own dime as well. Uh, their own time. Anyway. So big commitment for folks. I really appreciate everything the fire department rescue squad does and all the members that they have. So I appreciate your support as well. Thanks everyone. Great. Thank, thank you, Alan. Uh, we, we appreciate you all as well. Uh, okay. Any questions uh, on those uh, three articles, article six, article 15 and article 16, uh, which are the articles related to the uh, fire and rescue items. Stunned silence. There we are. All right. I do adhere to the, uh, we should wait long enough for it to be just uncomfortable to make sure that shy people or people who are having trouble finding the raised hand uh, can get to it. Uh, but I think uh, the comprehensive presentation uh, was satisfactory. Great. Uh, John, thank you so much. Absolutely, really guys. Thank it. you. And Alan uh, as well. All right. We are going to now go into the uh, individual articles uh, that, are, um, uh, that are listed. Uh, this is usually done as a... Uh, single uh, uh, article uh, at town meeting uh, because, as I understand it, the nature of an Australian ballot, these need to be done individually. So I'm going to do these, uh, like last year, for those who were here, in rapid succession. Um, but I will pause after uh, each one uh, and ask people to be ready uh, with uh, to, to hit the raise hand button uh, if you have a question. If we go too quickly and you want to ask a question about something earlier, we will entertain that just, but in the interest of time, we're going to want to go through this. Um, there are uh, individuals who um, are available uh, to answer questions for many of these items. Uh, I am going to uh, not call on those individuals uh, unless there is a question. Uh, if there is a question, I will then look to those individuals uh, to um, see if they can add any uh, additional information or uh, color uh, to the questions um, that are being uh, asked. Um, and Dave, there, I just want to make sure that that's accurate. There's anyone who's anticipating giving a lengthy presentation, and none of these items are new items, if I recall that as well. Correct. My my understanding is uh, people are on hand to answer questions if there if there are any questions on that particular article. Great. Uh, Excellent. And uh, in the interest also of time, uh, if we get to an item, someone does have a question, I will ask the person who would like to respond uh, to raise uh, their hand. Um, I think that'll be just the, the best way to do it. Uh, I will try to call on folks uh, if, if I can do that. So uh, Article 7, uh, shall the town vote to appropriate $3,000 to support CATV, Community Access Television? CATV airs the select board and select board meeting and school board meetings uh, and other community events on cable TV. 
Are there any questions on Article 7? Article 8. Shall the town vote to appropriate $1,500 to support Cover Home Repair, Inc.? Cover Home Repair provides home repair and weatherization for those in need. Are there any questions on Article 8? Article 9. Shall the town vote to appropriate $1,694 to support the Green Mountain Economic Development Corporation, GMEDC. GMEDC promotes economic development for a district of 30 towns. Are there any questions on Article 9? Article 10. Shall the town vote to appropriate $200 to support the Green Mountain Retired Senior Volunteer Program, RSVP. Green Mountain RSVP supports those 55 and older who want to contribute to their communities through volunteering. I'm just going to take a pause to mention that uh, there should have been, uh, there, there are uh, deeper descriptions of each of these uh, 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 articles um, in the town report that is available at the general stores as well as at town meetings. So if people are interested in the full report, there is uh, more detail uh, in those uh, locations. Uh, Article 11, uh, shall the town vote to appropriate $200 to support Green Up Vermont? Uh, Green Up Vermont uh, is, uh, Green Up Vermont organizes a statewide cleanup day in May and raises awareness for a litter-free environment. Uh, Article 12, shall the town vote to appropriate $500 uh, to support the Heartland Community Food Shelf. The Food Shelf makes food available to those residents in need and provides healthy snacks to school children. Are there any questions about Article 12? Article 13, shall the town vote to appropriate $13,500 to support aging in Heartland, uh, Heartland's Heartland Community Nurse Program? Uh, the Heartland Community Nurse provides one-on-one -on -one services to homebound seniors. Are there any questions on Article 13? Article 14. Shall the town vote to appropriate $2,000 to support the Heartland Farmers Market? The Farmers Market offers a children's program where kids age 5 to 12 learn about and eat fresh foods uh, and receive market pop bucks to spend on produce. And I see that we have a question from Bruce. Uh, Bruce, if you could please, uh, uh, Cedar, if you could pre please allow Bruce uh, to unmute himself. Uh, Bruce, if you could please say, state your full name uh, uh, before asking your question. Hi, it's actually Bonnie Goodman. We're on the same screen. Um, I just was looking for some clarification on what the farmer's market is doing with the $2,000. We've been budgeting since they built the um, oven, and I've never really gotten clarification on um, where those funds are going. Got it. Uh, is there uh, someone, it looks like, uh, Dave, I just want to clarify, uh, Melissa Wyman is who would be speaking on behalf? No. Uh, is there someone who would like to speak on behalf of the Heartland Farmers Market? Uh, Not I. Let's just asked to unmute. This is Sarah Bruce. I would not be speaking for the no. farmers market. Nope. Uh, so let's trying to Dave, who was, let me just pull this up. I don't believe we had someone who was previously identified. It used to be Brian. Mm. Uh, Brian has done it in the past. Right, in the past. Yep. Uh, Brian, uh, you, uh, what, um, so Cedar, if you could uh, allow Brian uh, Strappolino to be able to be unmuted, I think he may be able to speak on behalf of the farmer's market. Hi, this is Melissa Wyman. I'm speaking on behalf of the farmer's market. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Awesome. 
Um, thank you very much for the question. So uh, the funds that we've been allocating for the pop club um, involves a stipend for a pop club manager who organizes, I think it's a six to eight weeks of weekly events, coordinates with local farmers, comes up with questionnaires and handles all the transactions of the pop bucks where the kids get to go out and um, visit the farms and um, purchase using those funds um, to uh, some of the fresh food to take with them. Great. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Melissa. And sorry for not not calling on you when you raised your hand, as I had requested. And Brian, thank you for being um, uh, adroit on uh, thank you connecting. Uh, great. Uh, all right. So, uh, and uh, Brian, if you could take that. Thank you. Look at that. We've got a system. Any other questions uh, on this article, Article 14, uh, regarding the Heartland Farmers Market and the $2,000? appropriation request. Okay, uh, moving on. Oh, uh, Heather, would you like to ask a question about Article 14? You're able to unmute yourself. Actually, I am. Um... I just wanted to clarify that my understanding is that the farmer's market and the oven are two very separate things and they happened at different times and they have different committee members. That's, I just wanted to throw that out because I believe that this article applies to the farmer's market not to the oven. Uh, thank you, Heather. I, I, I will go out on a slight limb. Uh, I believe it was the, the uh, appropriation for the oven was originally via the Heartland Farmers Market, um, which is where uh, the, the two were connected. Uh, Melissa, it looks like uh, if, if uh, Cedar, if you could un, uh, allow for uh, Brian, to be unmuted again, I, I think there may be a clarification. Okay, Melissa, you should be able to unmute. All right. Um, yeah, so the, um, the town oven is organized under the umbrella and articles of organization of the Heartland Farmers Market. So it's a subcommittee of the Heartland Farmers Market. And um, we do have a committee of volunteers that organize the oven related events and then they collaborate with um, the oven market board itself so that we are we do work together um, and we are continuing to work together um, this season and into the future so just to clarify that great Heather did that clarify for it uh, yes totally. thank you Thank you so much, and thank you, Melissa, um, for correcting me. Thank you. Great. And Heather, if you can take down your hand, uh, that would be great. And we can mute Brian's. There we are. OK. Uh, so we're going to skip over, then, the uh, fire and rescue uh, items. Uh, which I believe takes us to Article uh, 17, uh, which reads, shall the town vote to appropriate $1,710 to support headrest. Headrest helps those in crisis and supports every stage of a person's recovery. And Heather, are you looking to ask a question? Uh, let's let's uh, allow Heather to unmute. Or it looks like she may have in. Yeah. I think we're okay. All right, Heather, we're, we're going to. Heather, do you. <laughs> no, ignore me. I'm just trying to lower my hand. <laughs> all good. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. Um, so if there are no questions on Article 17, Article 18, shall a town vote to appropriate $3,453 to support. Healthcare and Rehabilitation Services, 
HCRS. HCRS is a comprehensive mental health provider serving residents of Windsor and Wyndham counties. Uh, Heather, I, I'm going to assume that you're still, uh, unless you have a question. Okay, we, we will keep moving uh, and there we go. Oh. Uh, so um, article uh, uh, 19, uh, shall the town vote to appropriate $2,000 to support Mount Escutney Prevention Partnership, MAP. Uh, MAP promotes health and positive environments for youth. Are there any questions on article 19? Seeing none, Article 20, shall the town vote to appropriate $345 to support the Public Health Council of the Upper Valley. Public Health Council of the Upper Valley is a coalition of advocates for public health issues in the Upper Valley region. Are there any questions about Article 20? Article 21, shall the town vote to appropriate uh, $1,500 to support senior solutions uh, the Council on Aging for Southeastern Vermont. Senior Solutions pr promotes the well-being and dignity of older adults. Are there any questions about Article 21? Article 22, shall the town vote to appropriate $3,220 to support Southeast Vermont Community Action, SEVCA. SEVCA works with individuals to reduce the effects of poverty and create self-sufficiency. Any questions on Article 22? Article 23, shall the town vote to appropriate $1,500 to support the Special Needs Support Center? Uh, special Needs Support Center works with children and adults who have disabilities to foster independence. Are there any questions about Article 23? Article 24, shall the town vote to appropriate $1,500 to support Tri-Valley Transit, formerly Stagecoach Services. Tri-Valley Tri Transit provides public transportation in the uh, Upper Valley region. And I see that there is a hand raise. Uh, Bruce, uh, if you could identify yourself, whoever is speaking uh, through that um, handle. And, and if we... Uh, Cedar, if you could uh, take Heather off uh, line and then allow Bruce. There we go. Okay, Hi, it's uh, Bruce Renfro. Uh, just wondering, what services does uh, Tri Valley Transit provide to Heartland residents? Uh, I, to my knowledge, there not providing any bus service to Heartland. Um, so where do we fit into this? So we do not have someone who is assigned or has, uh, who has volunteered to speak on behalf of Tri-Valley Transit. Uh, Dave, do you want to provide a little bit of context or, uh, and if someone, if someone would like to speak on behalf of it, please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, but. Dave, do you want to? Yeah, I believe they enter into the um, to the to the park and ride um, off the exit off the the off and on ramp to ninety one. I'm gonna go out on the limb and say that they may provide uh, Medicare uh, transportation support to those that set it up ahead of time. Um, outside of that. Um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. I, 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 I think Dave, the um, the uh, bus service that comes to the uh, park and ride, I believe is is it the the movers or the river or something like that. I don't. Is that part of uh, is that part of the same organization, Tri Valley? Bruce, we have we have a couple of people I think have raised their hand to comment. Uh, okay. directly on this. Okay, uh, so great. Peter, if we could start with uh, with Rob Andreg. So on page, can you hear me? 
Yes. On page 95 of the town report, there's a report from Tri-Valley Transit, and it says that they provide an av average annual 1,497 free trips for Heartland residents. Oh, okay. okay. Great. So. Thanks, Rob. Yep. Thank you, Rob. Uh, and I believe Chuck wanted to make a comment as well. Yes, hi, Chuck Fenton. Yes, and Tri-Valley Transit, which used to be called Stagecoach, is the official Medicaid transport service for Heartland. Uh, yeah. The mover is not the official Medicaid. So if anyone who is eligible for Medicaid transport, especially for health care, they would call um, Tri-Valley Transit. And uh, I can testify I've talked with them and worked with them. They're very, very responsive and, and just really great. Great. That's good to know. Thank, Thank you for that. Great. Uh, Chuck, if you can go on mute and take down your hand, please. Thank you. Perfect. Any other questions on Article 24 related to Tri-Valley Transit? Excellent. Uh, moving on. Uh, Article 25, shall the town vote to appropriate $125 to support Mover Rockingham, formerly the current. Mover Rockingham provides public transportation in southern Windsor County and Wyndham County. Any questions on Article 25? Article 26, shall the town vote to appropriate $200 to support the family place? The family place operates programs designed to support and promote families and children. Are there any questions about Article 26? Okay. Article 27. Shall the town vote to appropriate $2,500 to support the Ottaquichi Health Foundation? The Ottaquichi Health Foundation promotes programs that help individuals and families meet their health care needs. Are there any questions about Article 27? Article 28, shall the town vote to appropriate $160 to support the Vermont Center for Independent Living? The Vermont Center for Independent Living works with those who have disabilities or who are deaf to live more independently. Are there any questions on Article 28? Article 29, shall the town vote to appropriate $10,500 to support the visiting nurse and hospice, VNH, for Vermont and New Hampshire. VNH is a healthcare organization providing quality home health and hospice care to people of all ages and in all stages of life. Are there any questions about Article 29? Article 30, shall the town vote to appropriate $900 to support the Volunteers in Action? Volunteers in Action work with the elderly and disabled to help them stay at home. Are there any questions about volunteers in action or Article 30? Article 31, shall the town vote to appropriate $1,000 to White River Council on Aging, Bugby Senior Center. Uh, Bugby Senior Center works with those 60 or older in their families with nutrition, exercise, and social services. Any questions on Article 31? Article 32, shall the town vote to appropriate $2,000 to support Windsor County Mentors? Windsor County Mentors matches adult volunteers with children throughout the county. Are there any questions about Article 32? Okay, Article 33, shall the town vote to appropriate $500 to support Women's Information Services, Inc., known as WISE, WISE provides advocacy and support for victims of gender-based violence. Any questions about Article 33? Okay. On to Article 34. Uh, and I am going to uh, read this article, uh, and then I'm going to ask uh, Sarah Bruce uh, to provide some uh, brief comments uh, on regarding this uh, article. 
Uh, Article 34, shall the town and residents of Heartland, Vermont, recognize the reality of climate change and the effect it is having and will have on the town. That the town and the residents of Heartland, Vermont, resolve to do our part to ensure that the state of Vermont reaches the 2025, 2030, and 2050 goals of the Vermont Comprehensive Energy Plan to reduce total energy consumption, meeting, uh, meet the remaining 90% of energy needs from renewable sources, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, as it's noted here, this is a non-binding advisory vote uh, to share the um, general view of the citizens of Heartland as opposed to a binding measure uh, for the town. Uh, so, uh, uh, so if we could, it's actually uh, aging in Heartland, I think is the uh, handle. Uh, and if you could, uh, Cedar, uh, allow aging in Heartland to unmute. There you are. Sarah, take it away. Thank you, ma'am. My name is Sarah Bruce, and I am the current chair of the Heartland Energy Committee. I'm speaking to you this evening to ask your support for Article 34, a climate resolution for Heartland. This resolution was submitted to the select board by the Heartland Energy Committee and was unanimously supported by the Heartland Conservation Commission. In the past two weeks, the Energy Committee has sponsored two Zoom discussions about climate change in Heartland, and the meeting announcements included the evidence to demonstrate that Heartland is warmer and wetter than it was 72 years ago when the weather data initially were collected or the collection began. The meetings were open to all and the minutes of both meetings were posted on the listserv yesterday. The change in Heartland's climate and the world's climate is directly directly correlated with a nearly 40% increase in the amount of CO2, carbon dioxide, and other greenhouse gases in Earth's atmosphere over the last century or so. These greenhouse gases trap the sun's heat that would normally be re-radiated out into space overnight. If these climate changes continue, Vermont's average annual temperature is projected to be 54 degrees by 2100, compared to 44 degrees today. This would give Vermont a climate like what is seen in the Southern United States today. These changes will degrade or eliminate our snow sports and our sugaring traditions. They will increase tick populations along with populations of other pests and they will increase encro encroachment of invasive species. The increase in frequency and intensity of storms will continue to increase the challenge and the cost of maintaining our roads and the ditches and the culverts. The state of Vermont has formulated a plan to mitigate these changes. This is called the Vermont Comprehensive Energy Plan or CEP. It's a state plan, but each Vermont town needs to contribute to the effort. Article 34 basically says Heartland will do its part to achieve CEP goals, reduce energy consumption, reduce greenhouse gas emission, and switch to renewable energy sources. Each regional planning commission has defined targets for each town in their region that together will allow the state to reach the CEP goals. These targets include the number of electric vehicles registered, the number of heat pumps installed, and the megawatt hours in the thousands, by the way, of additional renewable energy generated in each town and other metrics. Your energy uh, committee is working to help Heartland achieve its targets. We have a Solarize campaign being launched this coming Saturday. We're planning an EV rally, a couple of them, over the spring or summer, electric vehicle rally. And we're gearing up to launch community solar campaign this year. We can mitigate climate change if we agree to do it as a community. 
Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and uh, I, are there any questions uh, regarding Article 34? Any questions on Article 34? Okay. Uh, that brings us to the end of the articles. Again, these are all the uh, articles that you will find uh, on your ballot uh, that everyone should have received uh, and needs to be turned in uh, by, uh, by Tuesday. Uh, again, either uh, by delivering to the clerk's office, mailing, uh, putting in the secure drop box uh, that is uh, marked appropriately in front of uh, uh, town hall uh, or uh, on election day uh, where there will be JPs uh, able to uh, receive ballots as well. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is the discussion of other non-binding business. Is there any other uh, non-binding business to come uh, before uh, this meeting? Matt, this is Mary O'Brien. <clears throat> uh, my non-binding business is to thank you for doing such an excellent job tonight. I really appreciate my, my, it. My pleasure. I look forward to doing it someday in, in person. So <laughs> Me too. Uh, happy to do it. And thank you for everyone for prepping so well and for being understanding when I suggested timeframes uh, for, uh, for, for sharing, uh, particularly on important subjects um, that I know everyone is, is passionate about. So uh, thank you. Uh, and with that, and uh, Dave, keeping it under uh, two hours, uh, uh, I, I would uh, accept a motion to adjourn. Uh, Phil? Uh, I would like to offer a motion to adjourn this informational meeting um, and thank everyone for attending. Great. Uh, uh, Phil Hobby has made the motion to adjourn. All those in favor, please indicate by raising your hand. All those opposed, we are adjourned at 8 25 uh, p.m. Don't forget to vote. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Dave.